Church on the Rise would like to welcome you to the Ministry of the Word. We pray that it will help you find the will of God more clearly in your life. Who's been busy? Who is busy? Who's ever felt busy? I used to be so busy and I liked it. I, th- I used to wear it as a badge. I thought it was a good thing to be busy. I've since learned that uh, I don't care so much for busy anymore. Um, busy ran me down. And, um, but life is busy. Wouldn't you agree? There's so much going on in our lives, and it seems to be getting busier and busier. And even with these modern conveniences that we've got that are meant to help us, it still seems to be going faster and faster. There's more and more. There's the striving for better and better. And as I said, these conveniences should be helping us, really, helping us find more time, helping us find time for things that are really important, things that are are deserving of our time, things that are deserving of our attention. But as I said, these convenience, really rather than helping us get more time, they really have seemed just to add to the distractions and in themselves become more of a distraction to us and further detract us and distract us from the things that are really important in our lives. We seem to be, as some have said, time poor. Our lives are full. There's always something else to do. When you do that thing, you think, man, once I just get that done, have you ever said that? As soon as I get that done, as soon as we do this in the house, as soon as the kids, as soon as we, and yet there's just more and more and more around the corner. Our lives are so full. There's so much always to do. We're all unique creatures. Some of us more unique than others. Just peek, have a little sideways look out the corner of your eye, maybe at your husband or at your wife. We weren't allowed to say weird growing up. Mum said they're not weird, they're unique. So we're not, we're not weird today, we're, we're unique. But we're all different. We've all got different gifts and abilities, talents. We've all got different dreams and desires. We're all different shapes and sizes. And a lot of these things, our gifts and abilities, define who we are and cause us to stand out from all of those around about us, that we're not lost in God in a sea of people. God sees us, the individual, with our uniqueness and our uh, individualities. We stand out. We are so diverse. And God really does show off in the expansiveness of our individualities. He shows off his creativity. We are all so different. But one thing that we all have in common, one thing that it's just that the, the playing field's leveled out, One thing that we all have in common is that there's only 24 hours in the day for all of us. I don't know if you've, has anyone ever discovered the the, the 25th? I've gone looking for it. I haven't found it. And as I've gone to look for it, I've I've in fact found that my days have felt shorter and shorter and smaller and smaller. But for all of us, we all only get 24 hours in a day, seven days a week, 52 days in the year that we get. Time runs the same for all of us, second after second. Our total allocation of time might differ and does differ, and none of us know what we're going to get. It's a, it's a lucky dip lottery. We just get a surprise. It's, it's up now. We've finished. But uh, our allocation of time does differ. But the thing that's the same for all of us is that we all get 24 hours in a day. Andy Stanley, in his book, The Best Question Ever, says this of time. Your time equals your life. You can run out of money and still have time. You can run out of friends with time to spare. But once you run out of time, it's over. If there is one commodity we must learn to handle wisely, it's our time. Think about it. You can make more money, make new friends, take more trips, maybe even another child. No, we're right, thank you. Four's enough. We're a biblical family. We have multiplied, not like Les and Deb who only have two. We're a very unbiblical family. We've only had two children. They've only replaced. The Bible says to go forth and multiply. So Kelly and I have done that. <laughs> That's right. Is that your child? Is that your third child? That's all right. There's a crown in heaven for me. It's all right. No talking back from the front either. Shush. We can all make more things, we can do those things, but our allotment of time is inflexible. You only get so much of it. 
So it's important that we take a step back every now and then and assess our lives, assess where we spend our time, and have a look. Is, are we being, is time and things and tasks demanding of us, or are we setting the pace? Are we setting the tone? Are we the ones that are drawing a line in the sand and saying, no, this is what's important to me. This is how we're going to spend our time. This is how I am going to spend the most important, unrenewable resource that we have, which is our time. It's imperative that if we are to live a life that is well lived, that we dictate to the urgent, that we dictate to sometimes the meaningless things in our lives, and that we intentionally and deliberately create space in our worlds for what is truly most important. When random urgent activities constantly interfere with strategic deposits of time, it's like throwing away our most precious commodity. It's worse than wasting time. We end up wasting our lives. What we do with our time really determines the value of our lives. Do we make room for the important or spend our lives wholly on the urgent and or the meaningless? So what is truly important then? Jesus was asked this question, and it all boils down to two things. He makes it really easy for us. We've only got to remember two things. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 to 40 in the message reads like this. Teacher, which command in God's law is the most important? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. This is the most important the first on any list. But there is a second set alongside it. Love others as well as you love yourself. These two commands are pegs. Everything in God's law and the prophets hang on them. What's most important? What's important, Jesus? Well, number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Number two, Jesus, what's most important? Love others. Only two, it's so easy, isn't it? It's really hard, or maybe that's just me. I'm not as holy as all of you guys. But with that in mind, and that being said today, I want to talk this morning around the idea of making room, creating space, preparing a place. If we are to truly live and not just exist, we need to lead our lives and not have things dictate to us we're the ones that need to take control of our time and say, no, this is what's important to me. This is where I'm going to invest deposits of time. If I want to lead my family well, I need to dictate to, the, to, things, at, to things at home that vie for your attention and say, no, that's just going to wait for a moment because this is important. We need to leave our, lead our lives and make room for what is most important. Let's pray this morning. Father God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is living and that it is active. We thank you, Lord God, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, that it's the discerner of the hearts and the intents of man. It's, it gets right in. We thank you that your word shall achieve that for which it's set out for. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, here today, and we thank you that you are the great illuminator, that you lead us into truth. And this morning we come, Lord God, humble before you lay our lives out afresh before you and say, speak to us, Lord God. We want to leave this place different. We want to leave richer. We want to leave wholer. We want to leave this place looking and acting more like you. So Holy Spirit, we say, come, lead us in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen and amen. I was reflecting on the story of well, the account. I don't like saying story because it's not a storybook. It's a history book, the Bible. So I hate, I have this pet hate, and so I always say the account, not the story. So if I do say story, forgive me, be a forgiving people, but it's an account. I was reflecting on the account of, of uh, Mary and Joseph, and as they're uh, just about to see the birth of, of, of Jesus, and they're, they're not at home. They had to leave home because Caesar had decreed and, and ordered that there would be a census over the whole entire Roman Empire. So here we see Joseph and Mary traveling back to Joseph's hometown where he grew up as a boy to take part in the census when the time for Jesus to be born arrives. 
And so here they are with no home. Frantically, I would imagine, anxiously looking for a place that they could prepare for the birth of more than just their son, for the birth of the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And they're looking and what they're finding is that there's nowhere to go. Everywhere is full. There is no room at the inn. And what we find here in this story is that Jesus is born in a barn, in a stable. Why? Because there was no room at the inn. Just imagine that. Imagine you're that innkeeper, that you go down in history as being that man or that woman that had Mary and Joseph rock up on your doorstep asking if there was any room, your birth, and you turned away. The Messiah, you turned away the Son of God from being born in your place. Wow, I wonder, because you had no room or because you made no room. As I pondered on this account, I was struck by this thought that came and just really hit me. How many times have I missed something of Jesus being born in my life because there was no room? Because my life was too full, because I was too busy. There was no room, as it were, in the inn of my life. How often is my life too full? How often is it too busy to accommodate a birthing, as it were, of Jesus in my life? How many times has Jesus come knocking on my door only to be turned away because I'm too busy, I'm too full, there is no room? Because Jesus can only be born in places where there is room for him. Jesus never forces his way into places where he's not been invited into. And for Jesus to birth something new in our lives, we need to make space. We need to create space for him to come. And with the risk, running the risk of stating the obvious, you cannot fill something that's already full. If our lives are too full, if we have no room to accommodate, then we just might miss the birthing of Christ in our lives, in our relationships, in our marriages, in our finances, in our studies, in our ministry to our communities, to our neighborhood, to our friends and family. When all we have to do is this one thing in this context, is just create room and make space for Jesus to come and inhabit. And here's the amazing grace in the acceptance of Christ. He doesn't need the cleanliness and the orderliness or the polished presentation of an inn. He just needs the room of a messy stable. He can go amongst your stink and your mess and your dysfunction if we give him room. Aren't you glad that you don't have to have it all together for Jesus to do something in your life? that he does come in the midst of our stink. He does come in the midst of our mess. Aren't you glad? Are there any honest people in church this morning? I'm sure glad that he doesn't wait for me to be perfect. He just needs the space. He does not even demand, expect, or look for perfection. He just looks for opportunity. He's not put off by your stables. He's not put off by your mess. Rather, Jesus is strangely attracted to it and drawn to it. He doesn't need to have us to have it all together, but we do need to make room for him to come. You cannot fill something that's already full. Have you ever noticed that God doesn't compete with the things in our lives? He doesn't compete with those things that we maybe put ahead of him when we, our lives are filled with other things and we push him to the side. Jesus doesn't compete. He just stands to the side and waits for us to invite him in. Those things that we choose over him. He is a jealous God. Yes, he is. But he's a compassionate and gracious and patient God and he waits for us to invite him in to our world, invite him into our inns, as it were. Anytime, not sometimes, anytime we make the time, God fills it. Anytime we create space, God meets us there. Anytime we make room for him, that the God of all creation waits for you and for I. 
You know, I had this picture as I was up praying early this morning that sometimes, you know, when we're talking to our kids and they're distracted, and we're kind of just off standing towards the side, you know, just waiting for them, you know, and then they kind of turn to you and you go, oh, are you ready now, are you? That's not God. Isn't it amazing that he looks at us being distracted with things that he knows very well is actually robbing the very life, the very things that he died for us, and yet he's not standing there with his arms crossed going, well, when you're good and ready, Michael, No, what I find is as soon as I get good and ready, he turns to me and it's like, Mike, I'm so glad to see you. What an amazing God that we serve, that waits for us when we're the ones that should be waiting on him. Amazing grace of God. Jeremiah 29 verse 13 says this, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. The Message Bible puts it this way. When you come looking for me, you'll find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else. God makes it easy on the one hand, but it's difficult on the other hand because we have so many things vying for our attentions and for our affections. But Jesus promises us that the seeker always finds that those who knock, it's always open, that those who ask, they shall receive. That any time we make the time, he promises to meet us there. A couple of years ago, um, we were living down in Adelaide for the last 10 years and would have been about, I don't know, four years ago. um, We came back to visit family, which we tried to do as often as we could. And I think it's around Christmas time and we're staying at Kelly's parents' house. And I decided this morning that I was going to go for a run, as I, as I so often do, as you may notice, how fit and physique I have. And um, I know, it's, it's got to keep yourself looking good. And um, getting distracted in my mind, I'm going somewhere else, building myself up again. Got a good healthy ego. But uh, I was going for a run this day, and, and quite often as I, as I do with my run, I put my iPod in, put worship music on, and, and I use it as another opportunity. It's my, most certainly not the only time that I spend time praying, but I just use it as another opportunity just to reflect and enjoy the outdoors and meditate or worship and pray as I'm running. And so I was preparing to, to, to do this. I was you know, putting my runners on and my, and my running clothes on. And there was a lot going on in our lives at this time. Life was really busy. This may have been around the time where I thought busy was a good thing. And, um, and there was a lot of things going on, not necessarily anything bad, but life was just busy and it was full. And so here I am, I'm going out and I'm preparing to go for a run and I just remember putting my in my pocket and just about to take that step, that first step forward to begin to, to get into a jog and get into a run. And it was there at that moment that I made that deliberate decision, which I do every time that I pray, choose to focus on God, to make that deliberate decision to push aside distractions, those things that have been consuming my mind for so long, whether it be finances, kids, relationships, Kelly not being the the, the good wife that she should be, all those kinds of things that (laughs) kind of weigh you down and wear you down as a husband and, you know, she should be building you up. But to push those distractions to the side and focus on God. And it was in that split second, as soon, as soon as I made that deliberate decision to turn from, from things and look to Him, it was there in that moment, that split second, that instant, where I was overwhelmed with the amazing grace of God and His presence. That any time that we make the time, there God fills it. Amongst it all, that God's standing there waiting. And I was overcome. Now, I've had this experience so regularly throughout my life, but this is one of those occasions, again, where God just reminded me that, Mike, There's things for you to do. I'm not saying for you just to sit. I don't want you to be a monk. But will you set time aside and make the deliberate decision to come and seek me? And God, in the midst of our busyness, that when we choose and decide to turn our face from here and focus on him, there in that instant, God meets us amongst it all. What an amazing God. God is not found by the casual observer, but he is always found by the wholehearted seeker. That any time, any time. God's not a respecter of persons. One of my personal passions for, for new Christians, and Christian, uh, Christians just in general, really, because I've, what I find is that there's so many of us that have been Christians for so long and never really discovered that, that truth, that God wants to meet you. God is no favorites. What the Bible shows us is that he speaks to people. And so I've got a confidence to know that if he spoke to Moses, he's going to speak to me. If God speaks to Abraham, he's going to speak to me. If God speaks to David, spoke to David, he speaks to me. 
And so I want to know, if you've lowered your expectation because maybe you've not found the way to, to, to get in and grab a hold, don't miss out that God's got something for you. Push through because God wants to speak to you with a booming clarity. Not a confusion. I wonder, was that God? God wants to speak to you with a clarity. He's not a mean God up in the sky with a magnifying glass and we're like the little ants. Up there looking, go, ha ha, Michael doesn't know what to do. I tricked him. I love it when my kids are confused. That's not our God. That's not our dad. He wants to speak and bring clarity and lead us into rich places, into expansive places. Any time that we make the time, he will fill it. With the time that we have left this morning, I want to look at two accounts in the Bible that give us great practical application as to how we can make room in our lives for the two most important things. Love the Lord your God and love others. And how these priorities should shape how we use the precious resource of time. Second Kings tells the story of Elisha and a Shunammite woman who decides to make room. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 8 through 10. And I think we're going to have that on the screen. One day Elisha went to Shunam. A wealthy woman lived there and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. So let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, table, a chair and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. When it comes to making room for God in our lives, there are a few things that we see in this story. Not only did this woman make a physical room, but she created a space in her world, in her heart, in her life, in her day to day. She prepared a place. And I'd like to focus specifically on how this applies to us when it comes to us making room for God in our hearts, in our weeks, and in our worlds. There is a clear progression in this story and three dynamics that deserve our attention. Number one, she urged him to stay for a meal. There was this initial meeting, this initial experience, and she created space. She had space in her world to engage this man. She had an experience. Number two, she set a place for him so that whenever... He came by. He stopped there. Consistency has now been added to experience. She set a place at the table so whenever he came by, he stopped there. She prepared a place. Number three, she made a small room. It wasn't enough just to have him come and go. She wanted to build a place where he could dwell. She made room in her life to accommodate. Once we've met with God, it's not just enough to have him come by every now and then, one-off experiences, or even reg, you know, semi-regularly. No, we want him to come and dwell. For God to birth something new in our lives, we need to make room. In creating space, like the Shunammite woman, do we have room in our hearts? Do we have room in our thoughts? Do we live with an expectation for God to just drop in and do something immediate, something now? The woman urged the prophet to stop. Very strong word, urge. Do we urge God to stop in our lives? The word urge comes from the Hebrew word, which means kozak. It's where we get the word cause from, which means to fasten upon, to seize, to bind, to restrain to cleave, to constrain. Have we space in our day-to-day to constrain God, to grab a hold of him, to pull him in to us? Secondly, how do we prepare a place? Is there consistency in our experience, in our now moments? Has it moved from one-off experiences and one-off encounters to a walk? Are there times in our, in our days, in our weeks, that we have specifically set aside, prioritized, that we've said, God, this is your time? In church, we talk about things like in devotions, in quiet times, that we've set aside and said, God, this, this is just 
Nothing's getting in the road of this. This is a time that's just for you. Or are we just back at experience where it's just moment to moment? Because not only did she create space, not only are we to create space, but we're also to prepare a place, to prepare ahead of time, that we don't go into tomorrow and go, God, we'll just see. If there's some time, you might get lucky today, God. You never know. But no, we need to prepare a place for God in our lives, to book in an an appointment, as it were, to set it aside and prioritize. And thirdly, have we built room? Can consistency become dwelling? where it's even more than just something that it's, it's a specific time in the day. It's our whole day. What does Paul say? To pray unceasingly. What an amazing thought that that brings to us to say that we could throughout our day continually be connected to him, continually be awakened to the leading of his spirit in our lives. Have we set out our lives, our minds, our hearts, so specifically and deliberately, like this, like this woman, like the Shunammite woman, that she set up a home and furnished it specifically to accommodate the man of God to come and be a blessing in their lives and to be a blessing in his life. To have him call in consistently was not enough. Are our hearts and homes set up for God to take residence, as it were, in our lives and make room? Is there room in our inns, in our stables, to accommodate God, to come and birth something new in our lives. Because Jesus won't force himself into places and spaces that are full. He's a gentleman. Holy Spirit won't go where he's not invited. He only goes where he's invited. So what's important to Jesus? Well, number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Number two, love others. Genesis chapter 18 tells the story of Abraham and his three visitors. And it gives us a great picture of what it is to make room for others in our lives. And we're going to read Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through to 8. The Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. I don't know if that's how you say it, but that's how I say it. One day, Abraham was sitting at the entrance to his tent during the hottest part of the day. He looked up and noticed three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran to them, met them, and welcomed them, bowing low to the ground. My Lord, he said, if it pleases you, stop here for a while. Rest in the shade of this tree while water is brought to wash your feet. And since you've honored your servant with this visit, let me prepare some food to refresh you before you continue on your journey. All right, they said, do as you have said. So Abraham ran back to the tent and said, Sarah, woman. Don't you love that about guys? You know, as they spring it on you, you know, you come home and say, oh, Kelly, look, just letting you know, I've got 50 guys coming over an hour to watch the football. Would you mind just whipping something up? Hurry, Sarah, come on, get moving. Get three large measures of your best flour, knead it into dough and bake some bread. Then Abraham ran out to the herd and chose a tender calf and gave it to his servant who quickly prepared it. When the food was ready, Abraham took some yogurt. Mmm, yogurt. See, that's not ski yogurt. That's not Valia yogurt or Paul's yogurt. That's some good old-fashioned hot Middle Eastern yogurt right there. Mmm, goat's curd, that's delicious. And some milk, that's, that's sweetening the middle too. Took some yogurt and milk and the roasted meat and he served it to the men. As they ate, Abraham waited on them in the shade of the trees. What an amazing picture of hospitality. Abraham doesn't even know these guys. These are just three random guys to him that just happened to be walking past. And we see this amazing picture of hospitality. Three randoms. I love the language used by Jesus when we are asked, who are we to love? And the answer is neighbor. What's the story Jesus tells us when, 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 when asked, well, who is my neighbor? Trying to get out of it and trying to make it difficult. And he tells us the story of the Good Samaritan. Who is our neighbor? Our neighbor is the one whom we walk past and see a need that we can meet. That is our neighbor. Who is this other? Who is this person that I'm meant to love? Who is this person that I'm meant to accommodate to make room for? Well, the answer is right in front of you and behind you and to your left and to your right 
and next door to your house, at your local shops. It's the ones that we pass every day, but sadly, sometimes we never notice. The word neighbor in Greek comes from a root word meaning near. Who is my neighbor? Who's near you? And not in heart connection, simply in just proximity. Who's near you? What need is you? The Good Samaritan story tells us that, that he, you walk past him. You have, you have no responsibility for this man. You don't know this man. He's not your people group. You owe this man nothing, but by the sheer fact of your proximity to him and that you are a Christian, you are totally responsible to this man purely by the fact that you are near to him. Who is our neighbor? Those who are near. That's who we are to love. Abraham noticed. Abraham saw and he ran and welcomed. Do we have space in our lives in our thoughts, in our hearts, to notice those that are around about us, to actually see people? Because Abraham saw and he ran to welcome. In making room for others, this story gives us great application for living. Genesis, in verse 2, it says, he looked up and he noticed. The key word there, he noticed three men standing by. When he saw them, he ran to meet them and welcome them, bowing low, bowing low to the ground. The first quality that we need to have, that I need to have, to be somebody that notices others, that puts, uh, that puts others first, to have room in my life for others, is to be a noticer, to be somebody that sees people. Do we notice people as we go about our days, our worlds, our weeks? Or are people simply a means to our ends? Like when I go to the supermarket, the, the the girl or the guy at the cashier, are they just there to, just because I need groceries and that's all that they have to offer me? The, the mechanic at the garage because I need my car serviced. To be a noticer, to be like Jesus who sees people, I need to see people beyond what they can add to me, what they can offer me, what they can give just to me. To see the worth that Jesus has attached to them. To notice them and see them as people with dreams. See them as people with hopes. See them as people with fears, people with hurts, people with struggles. Because Abraham noticed them. Abraham had time in his busy world when it was inconvenient. It was the hottest part of the day, the text says. The hottest part of the day. Yet Abraham noticed and he ran. Abraham was no spring chicken when this happened. And he ran in the hottest part of the day to accommodate people into his world. Three random people. We need to be people that notice. Secondly, verse 3 to 5. My Lord, he said, if it pleases you, stop here for a while. Rest in the shade of the tree while water is brought to wash your feet. And since you've honored your servant with this visit, let me prepare some food. When he says me, he means Sarah. Let me prepare some food to refresh you as you continue on your journey. All right, they said, do as you have said. The second quality that I need to have, that we need to have, is a heart that's prepared to serve. Do we prepare a place to accommodate others? And this is both practically, preparing food, setting a table, as it were, the, the Shunammite woman setting a table before. But it's also in our hearts. Have we room in our hearts and in our thoughts, in our prayers, in our minds? Do we have space in our worlds, in our week to week, say, for God to say, cook a meal, cook a meal for that person. Send them an encouraging text, give them a call. Hey, I want you to give $100 to that couple so they can go out for dinner. It's a joke, I don't want you. <laughs> but are we prepared to give at a personal cost for the benefit of another? Isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that what Jesus does? That he gave at a personal cost for the benefit of us. And we as Christ ones, as Christians, are to give of ourselves at a personal cost for the benefit of those around about us. Abraham had prepared a place. Not long after Kelly and I had um, moved up here to Kalam, I think now furniture had just come, but the house was, the house was a bit of a mess. When a, a new family moved in just next door to us, 
And so life was, life was pretty, pretty chaotic for us as well. But it became evident pretty quickly, and not because we're uh, peeking over the fence, as it were, and we're, we're busybodies, because we're most certainly not. Kelly's a little bit, to be honest, but I'm not. <laughs> she's, not she's not at all. But, um, but it became obvious pretty quickly to both Kelly and I that these guys, these guys were in need. They were doing tough. Something had happened in their lives, and that, they were doing it tough, and they, they needed a hand. And so it turned out they didn't have really any furniture or anything. They were just kind of like, they were almost like squatting in the house. They, 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 they needed a hand. And uh, so we had, we had some furniture, and so we gave them a, a lounge suite. We gave them a TV and a video. We gave them a little fridge, and we bought them some stuff at the shops. Now, these things don't just happen. Look, they might to you. You might have been born a, a much nicer person than me, and I guess that's, that's distinctly possible because I, didn't, I wasn't born a particularly nice person. So maybe you were. Maybe you, you were born that way. But for me, this is not something that necessarily comes naturally to me. This is something that I've made a decision in Christ to be like him. And even more so, I think as the time came to Kelly and I moving up, I said to Kelly, you know, God just really given, had given us both a heart for Calandra. And I said, I just don't want to move somewhere again. And where this just becomes a place... I want to see people. I want to know the person who I get coffee off. I want to know their name. I want, I want to have a relationship with them, with the person at, at, at the checkout. I want to engage them. Now, they might not want to talk and you might not have time to talk, but I want them to feel like I saw them as a person, that I noticed them. And so this is a deliberate decision that Kelly and I have made. Kelly's much nicer than me. It does come, I don't know, more naturally or she's just more Christ-like. But for me, it's something that's been very deliberate and I've had to work very hard, hard for, but God answers prayer, amen. And so for us, it wasn't a hard decision to make because what? One, we've prayed, God, make us notices. We want to give you, we give you permission to come up to us and say, see that person, see that person. It wasn't a great surprise to us that we saw the need and had a desire to want to give to this need because we had prepared ourselves to be those kinds of people. So it wasn't hard for us to hear those things and to release those things in our life and to be generous. To be people that are others-focused, to give at the cost of self for the benefit of others, we need to be people who create space in our hearts, in our heads, in our weeks, in our worlds, in our finances, in our back pocket, in our wallet, to be generous people. It doesn't just happen. Good lives don't just happen. I shared this with the youth this week. There's a quote which we will never repeat in church. There's something that just happens. Who happens, so the world says, but good lives don't just happen. They're deliberate choices and actions that we make to have a life that has a specific outcome. If we want to be certain kinds of people, there's certain things that we need to do. and We need to open our hearts and lives wide to people. We need to create space and be notices, and we need to prepare places in our lives. Thirdly, this morning, we're getting there. We're getting to the end. Verse 6 to 8 says, So Abraham ran back to the tent and said to Sarah, Hurry, get three large measures of your best flour, knead it into dough, bake some bread. Then Abraham ran out to the herd, chose a tender calf, gave it to his servant who prepared it. When the food was ready, Abraham took some yogurt and milk roast and the roasted meat, served it to the men. As they ate, Abraham waited on them in the shade of the trees. The third quality we need is a heart that makes room. Abraham was in no hurry to get these guys going. He'd done all of this, and then he's just standing there waiting on them. Waiting on them in the shade of the tree. He was there for them. Are we the types of people that are there for others, that they've got our time? It's not like move on now. Have you ever talked to someone and said, they've said hello, and you're like, you're not really talking to me? Have you felt that? It's, isn't it a terrible feeling? It's a sinking feeling. It's like, oh, Whatever. If you want to talk, talk. If you don't, you don't have to. You don't have to say hello. But we do know when somebody's genuinely interested in us. I don't know about you, but I want to be that person. I want to be a person that sees people, that's got time for people. Why? Because people are important. People are important because they're important to God. They're important to us. It's why he came. It's why he gave his life. If we are to truly live our lives and spend our lives on the important rather than on the urgent and sometimes the meaningless, we need to be people who make room for God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And we need to be people who make room for others. Love others as well as you love yourselves. If I could have the musos back, please. And if I can have the team distribute communion too, that would be 
fantastic. So, for God to birth something of him in our lives, in our marriages, in our finances, our families, relationships, our call, our ministry to our community, for God to birth something in our dreams, for God to do something in us for others, all he needs in this context, all God needs is some room and some space. All God needs is availability. All God needs is some of your time. Because any time we make the time, God fills it. He is always, always found by the seeker. We, as I started this, this morning by saying we all have such full lives. But are they leading us or are we leading them? Are we leading them to where we want to be? And are these choices making us into the kinds of people that we want to be? Am I a good dad? Do I prioritize time with my daughters? Or am I too busy and say, sorry, girls, I can't spend time with you today, this week, this month, this year, because of the urgent, because of the meaningless, because I'm spending time on these conveniences that are meant to be helping us. That we all, And I'm, I'm guilty. I'm confessing again this morning my sins for you all this morning. Wasting time on social media, wasting time on, on computers, just meaningless. And when we look at these things and add these things up, these moments of time for the course of a lifetime, what we find is, is that they add up to nothing. There is no cumulative value to the insignificant things that we do in our lives. It all adds up to zero. But there's two things that matter. There's two things that have meaning that are most important in our lives. And it's creating space and room for God in our hearts and in our lives and creating room for people in our worlds. We need to make room. And as we finish today, I thought it would be great to celebrate around communion. And remember to stop and pause and reflect, I guess in the ultimate make room moment in church. And that's why I love the deliberateness of communion because we stop and pause and reflect and take time out. And remember the one that paid the ultimate price to first make room for us so that he would make room, so that we could make room for him. Jesus gathered together on that night before he'd go to the cross and he took the bread. He broke and he gave thanks. He said, this is my body to be broken for you. He said, take it and eat it. This morning, why don't we eat together today as we remember. same way he took the cup he gave thanks he said this is my blood shed for you do this in remembrance of me so this morning as we remember what he's done for us why don't you take and drink we remember God, we just thank you in this place that you gave it all so that we can in turn say and sing, God, you can have it all. All of our lives, all of our hearts, all of our time, Lord God, as we speak this morning and think and talk and reflect around the thought of making room, Lord God, as we come around the communion table, Lord God, we say we are yours. Our life is yours. Our time is yours. And so as we go back into worship right now, I just invite you to stand and sing. And declare with me, God, you can have it all. Every part, every part of my life, all of my time, all of my energies, all of my affections, all of my attentions, God, you can have it all. We want to make room for you in our lives today. We trust you've enjoyed the ministry of the Word. And if you'd like more details or how to contact our church and its resources, look at our website www.churchontherise.org.au.